Hey guys, today I'm coming to you as a doctor mom. Today I want to cover the fears that you're feeling about the COVID-19 vaccine. And I want to talk to you as a doctor mom who has her own story of being hesitant about vaccines. Stay tuned because I think this will really help. Okay, before I get started, I want to let you know I found out a cool thing that I learned how to do. I put time cards on this YouTube. So if you go down into the show notes where there are a ton of resources and references that I really want you to have a look at and share with your friends and family if you want to. But down there in the time cards, you can go to the specific things that I address because maybe you've only got one or two questions. But also if you want to watch the whole thing, that's cool too. First, I want to tell you my story of vaccine hesitancy. And you might think, how is an OBGYN a doctor, and I'm also married to a pediatrician, how is somebody like her feeling hesitant about vaccines? And I'll tell you that when you're a parent, I get it. I get that it can feel really hard sometimes to trust everything that you read. So here I am, a physician with my oldest, who was about to turn one, and at the 12-month visit, that's when you get your MMR vaccine or your measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And I fully believe in vaccines, and I fully believe in vaccinating on schedule, as does my husband. But for some reason, I was feeling nervous about this visit. Why? Because the MMR vaccine is the one that has gotten all the press about vaccines being linked to autism. And this is all because of a physician who did a study that has since been revoked because he lied about the data, but he did a study that said that vaccines were associated with an increased risk of autism. He lied about the data. The study has been discredited. He has lost his medical license, but he's done plenty of harm because there are many people in the community who still believe this and we have no data. And so there's a lot of noise out there about vaccines and autism and vaccine hesitancy and declining vaccines. And again, even though my completely objective medical brain who believes in science, who believes in vaccines, who understands why they're amazing, I found myself starting to feel nervous going to this appointment. I never had any intention of not getting the vaccine for him. I thought as a mom, what if a choice that I make hurts my kid? What if something happens down the road and I think, oh man, was it because of that vaccine? So when you say that you're hesitant about getting a COVID vaccine, a brand new vaccine, I want you to know that as a physician and as a woman, as a mom, as a human, I understand you and I hear you. There's so much noise out there now more than ever. And so it can be really hard to wade through it. This YouTube is not for the people who just are gonna say vaccines are the devil and they're evil and I will never take one and it's a conspiracy and there's microchips. Like I'm not gonna sit here and argue with all of that because I just won't address things that are completely false. This YouTube is also not for people who say, well, if you don't get the vaccine, you're completely stupid and I don't wanna be around you and I'm not gonna care for you and whatever. I I'm here for the people in the middle people who care about themselves, care about their family, care about their friends, and just are feeling a little hesitant about that decision. So let's dive in. Start with a couple assumptions. You're not stupid for feeling nervous, and you want to do what's best for you and your family and your friends. Let's keep that mindset throughout the whole time. So you may be feeling that this vaccine has been rushed. And the truth of the matter is, is that it hasn't. I know that it seems like it has because this pandemic has been around for less than a year. How could we possibly have a vaccine that quickly when we know that vaccines normally take decades? The thing is, is that the technology that this mRNA vaccine was based upon was started 30 years ago. That doesn't get as much play in the media. Why? It's not that catchy of a headline, is it? But maybe it can help you understand that all the safety checks that are done in any vaccine trial, all of them were done. Nothing was skipped. In fact, when there were some times where some concerns came up, there were actually pauses in some of the trials. And then once they analyzed them and decided that they were not anything dangerous, they resumed the trial. The reason this vaccine was able to be developed so quickly not covering the fact that this technology started 30 years ago, and I'll get more into that. The reason it happened is because there has never before been so much cooperation and funding. And so when the government threw money at this, at these private corporations making these vaccines, and when these companies were completely transparent about their protocols and how they were do making their vaccines, we were able, everybody was able to work together and we were able to move forward so quickly. Wow, wouldn't that be nice if this happened in the future with scientific advancements? Maybe that's something good that comes out of the pandemic. We were also able to do these studies really quickly because of enrollment. And one really sad factor is that when you have a disease that is infecting millions of people worldwide, it's not hard to find people to enroll. Another sad factor is that when you have no good treatments for said disease, people are really excited to enroll because they know that there's nothing else out there. So to have people so excited to be in a vaccine trial, that doesn't normally happen. So because of all that, that's why the vaccine was able to be produced so quickly. No safety steps, no data analyses, nothing that should have been done in a normal vaccine, typical long-term vaccine trial or development, none of that was skipped. 
how do we know it's safe long term? I've had people ask me, how can you put something into your body when we, it's completely new and we don't know anything about it? And I hear you. The logical part of my brain totally hears you and understands why you're asking that question. For me, it's about weighing risks and benefits. I know the risks of COVID. I know the chance that if I were to get the disease, that there's up to about a 10% chance that I could have long-term symptoms from it, that months afterwards I could still be coughing and having ox oxygen saturations that are way too low and I may need to be readmitted to the hospital. I know there's a 2% chance of me dying from it, which doesn't seem a lot to some people, but when millions, are people, millions of people are infected, that's a game of roulette. And I understand that I had the risk to spread it to other people. So for me, it's about the risks, the known risks versus the benefits of a 95% effective vaccine. That's an amazing effectiveness. And so when I take into account the known risks, the known benefits, and then I think about the possible risks long-term associated with the COVID vaccine, well, here's the thing. Yeah, we've been following people for less than a year. Nothing has come up so far. I hear you, you're like, that's not long-term, I hear you form of this vaccine, a form of the mRNA vaccine, so obviously not for COVID specifically, but when we're talking about a different virus where they develop this technology, it was given to people about seven years ago. Not a huge number, but about 1,700 people. None of those people have had issues so far. Theoretically, am I worried about long-term risks? This is a very simple vaccine. It's got such a short list of ingredients. The actual component that's in the vaccine is degraded very quickly in your body. It basically serves a list of instructions to your body to fight the spikes that are on the coronavirus virus. And it's not integrated into your DNA. It's not a live virus. It's, to me, it's a very simple vaccine, a very simple technology, a very beautifully elegant technology. And I don't see how that could affect me long term. But I hear you and I understand, and I do wanna reassure you that we are collecting long-term data. However, I wanna get back to life as normal and I want people to stop dying and I want my kids to be able to go back to school and I want people to be able to get medical care whose surgeries have been canceled. So I'm willing to accept a small amount of risk and I really do trust this technology. And so far over 80,000 people have received the vaccine with no concerns. So I feel really confident about that. I do, I trust the science. COVID only has a 2% death rate. I hear you on that one too. And I've already kind of covered this, but 2% of millions and millions of people is hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people dying. I've already talked about this too a little bit, but the people who have long-term symptoms, this is not a disease that everybody recovers from. And we do not know the long-term effects of what this disease does to people. That I am much more worried about than the potential long-term effects of the virus. That scares me. And the death count that you're seeing right now is not accurate. That's just counting direct COVID deaths. It is not taking into account the excess deaths that are from things that are not getting treatment because people can't get in to see their doctor or surgeries have been delayed. So we're talking about people dying of strokes and heart attacks because they're not coming into the hospital because they're afraid. We're talking about people dying from cancers because they're not getting diagnosed because they can't get in to see their doctor or they can't have their surgery. There are so many other people dying and having long-term issues that will this will last for years and years and years. We're also not talking about the huge, enormous mental health load. We are in survival mode right now, but there are people committing suicide, there are kids struggling, there is enormous amounts of PTSD. And when this pandemic actually finally ends and people are out of that survival mode, what we are going to see is people break down and realize, oh my God, what the hell did we just go through? And I am worried for these people. So that 2% death rate is completely inaccurate and really disrespectful to those people who have had COVID or have had a family member who've had it and have died from it. I hear you when you say it's a new technology and I'm worried, I hear you. I've kind of alluded to this before, but it's not brand spanking new. We didn't just come out with this eight or nine months ago. This is based on an MRA vaccine that was designed 30 years ago during the SARS epidemic back in 2003. Why did it not get completed and, and brought to market? Well, we didn't need it and there was no funding. So when there's no funding for something and there's no market for something, there's no reason for the private companies to invest billions of dollars into vaccine technology. I am actually really excited for this vaccine technology because I think using it will be able to plug in the mRNA for future viruses and future pandemics and be able to get a vaccine very quickly. Are you concerned that this vaccine is here just to make people money? I hear you on that too. And I can tell you that's not happening either. Healthcare workers, I don't know of a single one who hasn't taken a pay cut. The only people in healthcare who are making any money right now are the insurance companies because people are not using their insurance to do the elective procedures that they would had they not been canceled or held off because of COVID. Physicians, nurses, everybody top to bottom in the healthcare system have all taken pay cuts, myself included. And we're all working the same, if not more. We are not making money off of this vaccine. It is being offered for free to almost everybody that I know. 
People like me are not getting bonuses if, if our patients or if we get a vaccine, absolutely not. If you're pregnant, I can understand your hesitancy about this vaccine too. And that's why I am so glad that so many organizations who care for pregnant people have come out supporting that this vaccine should be available to people who are pregnant. It should not be mandated, but it definitely shouldn't be withheld and it should be shared decision making. And I've got those references and resources in my show notes below. But I want you to stop and think that we know that pregnant people are 1.7 times more likely to die if they get COVID. They're three times more likely to end up in the ICU. Myself included, we have all seen bad outcomes of pregnant people who get COVID. And it's really hard to see somebody who's young and healthy, her only risk factor being pregnancy, have a bad outcome from COVID. And if there's a vaccine that could potentially save her life and that life of her baby, we physicians get really excited about it. But I understand your hesitancy and that's why I want you to talk to your doctor or midwife. You deserve a good informed choice. The same thing with breastfeeding. You deserve to have a good informed choice and to be able to make that choice and not have that vaccine withheld, but also not feel forced into it. I've gotten lots of questions about infertility and I'm not even gonna try and break that down because Dr. Natalie Crawford, a fertility physician who is an amazing person who does a great job educating here on YouTube, as well as on TikTok and Instagram, has addressed it beautifully. So I've included links to her platforms below and I want you to go look at it. The short version is the whole idea that this vaccine could be linked to fertility is kind of ridiculous. And if anything, being infected with the COVID vaccine as a male has been shown to, de to mess with sperm quality. So that's more of a concern for fertility. In conclusion, I want you to understand that as a doctor and as a mother and as a person who's a patient too, I can totally understand why this COVID vaccine feels new and scary and rushed and there's just too many questions. That's the subjective part of my brain. The objective part of my brain understands and really trusts the science. And I want you to feel that way too. And I hope that you will look at the resources I've included here because I've read through the FDA statements. I've read through the studies. It is really important to get the information from reliable sources and not people who are biased either way. And as a physician, the only bias I have is that I want this pandemic to end. And of course I believe in safety. I completely understand feeling nervous. And if any doctor or healthcare worker tries to belittle you for feeling that way, I'm sorry. I can't wait to get this vaccine. I haven't had it yet as of December 21st, but the first second that I'm able to go make that appointment, I guarantee you I will. It doesn't mean that I'm not gonna feel some occasional hesitations, but I believe in the science, I believe in the safety of this vaccine, and I believe it because I have informed myself with trusted sources, and I want you to feel empowered that way too. Don't let people take away your power by feeding you false narratives. And if you have questions, please ask them, but make sure you're asking them from people who can answer them objectively and without an agenda. With that said, I hope you have a great day. You stay safe, wear that mask, wash those hands, and I promise we'll all get back to normal soon. Bye-bye.